Hello, I'm Dr. Lynn Sneddon at the University of Liverpool in the UK. Welcome to this presentation. I want to thank the conference organisers for inviting me to talk about the work that my laboratory focuses on, which is understanding the behaviour, physiology and neurobiology of aquatic animal welfare. Please do ask questions during this presentation or if you'd like me to clarify anything. And I'll hope to answer all of your questions at the end of this presentation. Just to get to know you better, I'd like to ask you, my audience, whether you actually use fish. And this can be as experimental models or as animal carers or as veterinarians. So I'm just going to launch a poll now. So if you could say yes or no, do you work with fish either directly or indirectly? So we seem to have a 50-50 split so far. With approximately half of you uh, using fish and half not. So I hope the people who don't use fish please uh, find this presentation interesting and I hope to update you on the current evidence for pain perception of fish. So as you can see, around 50%, 56% sorry, of uh, attendees actually do work with fish. So what I hope to do in this presentation is give you an idea of the key to nets or criteria that an animal must fulfill to be considered capable of pain perception. I'm also going to address the arguments against fish pain perception and the scientific evidence for pain in fish. If we accept fish are capable of some form of pain, then we have to have the means to assess that pain and, of course, then minimise it. So I hope to uh, discuss how we can do that using non-invasive measures and how we can provide pain relief. So what are the key to nets? Well, the first, of course, is the machinery to detect potentially painful stimuli and process that stimuli. So an animal must have nociceptors, the receptors that preferentially detect noxious, potentially painful stimuli. You must also have pathways from those nociceptors from the periphery to the central nervous system, the brain. You should also have uh, processing within the central nervous system that differs from neutral stimuli, non-noxious stimuli. Then the animal should show adverse changes in behaviour and physiology that are not just simple reflexes. And these should be reduced by administering pain relief analgesics. And finally, the most difficult and interesting to net is some form of consciousness in the animal. Now, obviously, consciousness is a, a very um, interesting and in involved subject, and I don't have time to go into the background of consciousness here, but I'm going to focus for the sake of this presentation on two indicators, self-recognition and whether the animal seeks to reduce its pain such that there must be a negative effective component that motivates the animal to pay a cost to accessing pain relief. So, before I begin summarising the arguments against pe fish pain perception, I'd like to understand whether uh, you actually feel that there is the possibility of fish perceiving pain when they're damaged. So I'm just going to launch another poll. This poll asks the question, do fish perceive sensory pain? So when you injure them, is there some form of pain? And you can answer yes, maybe, or no.
So, so far we have the majority saying, yes, there is the likelihood of uh, fish perceiving sensory pain. We have um, a proportion who say maybe, and um, a small proportion who actually say no. So I'll just show you the results for that. And I'm going to take these results down so that I can ask Sue again at the end of this presentation. So what are the arguments against fish pain perception? Well, skeptics and critics of fish pain um, suggest that fish must have a, an identical human brain to be able to experience pain. So they must have a highly developed cortex. They also suggest that because fish don't have a human brain that they are not conscious. So any responses to painful stimuli are simply nociceptive reflexes. The fish doesn't know it's in pain. A lot of work has been published on the acetic acid test in fish. This is a standard pain test in mammals and humans where you inject acetic acid subcutaneously. The adverse changes in behavioural and physiological response is seen in fish. Critics suggest this is just a response to a toxicant and it's not noxious or painful. And finally, uh, one of the arguments that's used is that fish don't have the same proportion of C fibres or E-delta fibres that act as nociceptors as humans or mammals do, and therefore they cannot perceive pain. So I'm going to take each of those arguments and show you the scientific evidence for pain perception of fish. So I'm going to address those directly. So skeptics have suggested that you must have a highly developed human-like neocortex to be able to perceive pain. And as such, only primates and humans can have pain perception. If you agree with that definition, then you're basically saying that no other animals, mammals, birds, reptiles or amphibians experience pain, even though there are a, a substantial amount of published experimental data to the contrary. There are other definitions, so one could get down to the semantics of the definition. So for example, humans with a perfectly good intact neocortex can't feel pain if they have congenital sensitivity, sorry, insensitivity to pain with anhydrosis, SEPA, due to mutations in the NTRK1 gene. Now fish do actually possess this gene. Other scientists have suggested that it's the connections between the thalamus and the forebrain that is incredibly important for pain perception and indeed fish do have those connections. So there are other definitions of pain. This, um, this idea that you must have a human brain is rather anthrop anthropomorphic really. Um, I think we need to consider that animals have evolved in a completely di different way to humans and have a different life history and ecology. Many people suggest that evolution is linear so that when fish diverge from the vertebrate line, that uh, they suddenly stopped evolving. However, uh, we know that that's not true. Some people consider this on a phylogenetic scale such that fish would have a painful experience, but it would be much more primitive than the human experience. Whereas we know there are examples of, of animals evolving to develop different structures that perform the same functions, so analogous structures. And a very good example of this is the avian cortical regions. The avian cortices are totally different in structure to the human cortices, yet they perform similar functions. So to say that one must have an identical brain region to a human doesn't really factor in that evolution may have evolved a completely different structure to perform that function. Why do skeptics suggest this, that um, because you don't have a neocortex, it's just a nociceptive reflex. Well, they use evidence from vegetative humans, also called unresponsive wakefulness syndrome. When you stimulate these people with painful stimuli, they perform um, reflex responses. At least that's what we thought. Until recently, Markle et al. 
uh, Markle and colleagues in 2013, which you can see here. They performed a study on such patients and found that there was brain activity in the areas important for pain processing. So it is likely that these vegetative patients are experiencing pain. So this is not just a reflex response. Also, a uh, skeptic suggests that the fish brain is very rudimentary, that it's a uh, uh, kind of unsubstantiated, undifferentiated blob. But in fact, although the fish brain is much smaller and has fewer neurons, fish are the most uh, diverse vertebrate group and very uh, successful. And they've also, they also perform very complicated behaviors with their small brains. This particular study here by Rinkin Willeman shows you that when tracer was applied to the forebrain, that there are extensive connections throughout the brain. And these connections do project to areas that are important in mammalian pain processing, such as the thalamus, the periaqueductal gray, the locus curalis. So this does show you that the connections do exist. So studies have sought to understand whether the fish brain is active during a potentially painful event and whether this is just restricted to hind brain and spinal cord reflex centers as skeptics have suggested. So what you can see here is a study by uh, Peter Laming. Uh, he and his colleague Rebecca Dunlop performed an experiment where they recorded neuronal activity from various areas in the brain. So the spine, the cerebellum, the optic tectum, and the telencephalon or the forebrain. And what you can see here is the electrical activity in goldfish in these different areas that are mediated by A delta fibers in yellow here or C fibers in red. And you can see that the activity does project right up to the forebrain. It is not restricted to spinal cord and hindbrain. In my lab, we looked at global gene expression using microarrays. So we looked at the molecular level to see if the genes were differentially expressed when common carp were subject to the acetic acid test. And what we did is we compared them with saline treated carp in innocuous stimulus. And we looked at the differential expression of genes at 1.5 hours, three hours, and six hours after the treatment in the forebrain, the midbrain, and the hindbrain. And what you can see quite clearly is that most of the gene expression changes occur in the forebrain at 1.5 and three hours. At six hours, the fish are starting to recover and return to normal behavior. And when we looked at those genes, we saw many genes which are known to be involved in pain perception in mammals. So these are evolutionary conserved. To try and understand this in a bit more depth, I decided to use an approach which is used in humans and mammals uh, routinely to look at pain perception and identify the brain areas that are are important. So I used uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging in Anime van der Linden's lab in Antwerp. And we used common carp and what we did was we applied either saline to the carp's face or acetic acid as a painful stimulus. And then we took images of the brain subsequently. And what did we find? Well, what you can see from this graph is that when you apply saline, there is no significant change in relative global signal intensity in the brain. So there's no effect of saline. However, when you apply acid stimulation, you can see there is a dramatic change in activity. And this is actually dose dependent. Here we have 5% acetic acid, 10% acetic acid, and 20% acetic acid. So there is a concentration dependent response. And this is what we would see in mammalian studies. Just to give you an example, here are some of the images that we got. This is an image of 10% acetic acid stimulation. What you can see here is the eyes of the fish here and here. And then we can see the forebrain, the midbrain optic tectum, and the hindbrain, and you can just see the spinal cord.
Now, the image on the left shows the increase in blood oxygenation signal. So these areas light up and this is subtracted from saline. So this is the effects of acid over and above the effects of saline. And you can see that it is indeed the forebrain and the midbrain, which is affected with some areas here towards the hindbrain. The image on the right is the decrease in blood oxygenation. So oxygen could be used up or diverted away from these regions. And again, you can see this is in, mainly in the midbrain. So we can see that activity is occurring in the forebrain and midbrain and not restricted to hindbrain and spinal cord. So I think from these studies, we've shown that the brain is active during painful stimulation, that it is different from innocuous stimulation. So on an electrophysiological, molecular and uh, blood oxygenation level, the brain is active. Now, what about this question of consciousness? It's a very difficult subject in animals because obviously I've never been a fish. I don't know what fish experiences directly. We can't measure it. All we can use is experimentation. And this consciousness is used as a barrier really, I think, to progress in science, but we need to address it. Some scientists like myself and also uh, Marion Stamp Dawkins in her recent book, Why Animals Matter, believe that we know very little about consciousness in humans. We can't pinpoint it on a specific area. Recognizing fear and disgust involves the amygdala in humans. So one could say then one must have an amygdala to be conscious. And fish, reptiles, amphibians do have an amygdala. However, other types of stimuli, for example, visual stimuli, require other areas of the brain for conscious perception, for the awareness of perceiving the stimulus. And what we would suggest is that perception and awareness go hand in hand. That actually, when you perceive a stimulus, the consciousness is, or, or the awareness of that stimulus occurs concurrently. And I think that we need to think very clearly about what is the function of pain. It motivates us and animals to avoid damage that could lead to disease or to mortality. So it has to be a really negative experience. It has to have a negative effective component for animals to change their behavior and base their future decisions on. And so for me, I think the perception and awareness goes hand in hand. If it's not a negative effective experience for the animal, if it's not deleterious or detrimental, the animals would continue to injure themselves. Now, other scientists have uh, ideas that we actually know enough about animal consciousness that we can come out and say that the absence of a neocortex does not stop an animal from being conscious of or, or experiencing negative affective states like pain, fear and distress. And I'm sure you're all well aware of the Cambridge Declaration on Consciousness which did agree that there was enough evidence for animals being conscious and that we didn't need to insist that they had a neocortex. Um, you can actually uh, look at the video on YouTube and actually see the declaration yourselves. So what, what evidence is there for fish being conscious? Well, one of the uh, classic experiments is whether animals recognize themselves in a mirror and they have a sense of eye and recognize that the image is actually them. However, in fish, mirror tests generally fail. The fish sees another um, image. It just thinks that it's a conspecific and it generally acts aggressive towards it. Lev Yudin and Katzier have Lev Yudin and, and Katzier have um, produced a review to address this.
Um, and then in this review, they have said that there is evolutionary reasons for this issue. And the reasons are that terrestrial animals actually come to water bodies to drink. And because of that, they often see their, their reflection in that water body. So they've evolved with a mirror image of themselves. So they, in, in terms of evolution and life history, they, they have actually seen themselves. So that's why mirror tests work in terrestrial animals. However, in fish, they live in an aquatic world beneath the surface and they will never come into contact with a mirror image so they they are not sort of predisposed to recognizing themselves in a mirror and i think this is a very important point we need to think about the ecology the evolution and the life history of the animal to design tests that that actually are relevant and not be anthropomorphic about these and one of the ways that has this has been done is by thunken and colleagues who looked at olfactory recognition in cichlid fishes. And actually fish live in a very uh, aquatic, uh, soupy type um, environment and the chemical communication is incredibly important. So fish, when given the choice between their own odor and a foreign conspecific odor, spend more time with their own odour. So uh, this suggests there is some evidence for self-recognition in fish. The other way to determine whether there's a negative effective component associated with, with painful stimulation is to see whether animals will pay a cost to accessing analgesia. That would suggest that they have a negative internal experience of pain and that they seek to reduce that. So I designed an experiment where I tested this theory out. In this experiment, I used zebrafish and the fish were placed into a uh, choice chamber. The fish were placed in the start box and allowed 45 minutes to explore. One of the sides of the chamber that they could enter through this door was barren, brightly lit, now, fish don't like barren, brightly lit conditions. This was an unfavorable side. The other side had gravel and plants and also had a, a shoal of fish behind a, a transparent barrier. So this, this side was highly favorable. The fish were placed in uh, twice a day. And once they had chosen a specific side for six consecutive trials, we then treated them either by giving them the acetic acid test, subcutaneously injecting into the, the lips, or saline as a control. Half of these were retested in this choice chamber with analgesic dissolved in the barren, unfavorable chamber. The other half, there was no analgesic present. Just to give you an idea of what this looks like, um, here, uh, we have the, the uh, choice chamber. You can just see there's two doors here and here. Um, there's, you can just see some fish back here. This arrow points to a fish in the enriched side. And here we, you can see in the barren area, um, there's a bright light, but in this case, there is a fish actually in there. You can see that with this arrow indicated, this black arrow here. And just to show you that the analgesic stayed within the barren chamber, we placed dye in the barren chamber, and you can see that there's very little flush out from our chamber. So we dissolved lidocaine in the barren chamber for half of the fish. So what did we find? Well, what you can see here is the, the time spent in either the unfavorable chamber in red or the favored chamber in blue. And here we have saline injected fish the controls with no energy analgesia minus analgesia or the controls plus analgesia acid injected fish minus analgesia and acid injected fish plus analgesia and you can see that the controls with no analgesia continue to spend most of the time in the favored area those with analgesia again most of the time in the favored area when the fish were acid injected, painfully stimulated, they spend most of their time in the 
enriched favored area, even though analgesia, uh, sorry, analgesia is not present. But when analgesia was present, you can see that there is a shift. The fish are now spending more time in the unfavorable chamber. And I would suggest that is because they seek to reduce their pain and are willing to pay a cost of being in an unfavorable environment to access that analgesia. So I think that's good evidence that there is some sort of form of negative internal affective component. So we've shown now that the fish do pay a cost to accessing analgesia and there is some evidence for self-recognition. What's the next criticism? Well, the response, the behavioural and physiological changes in response to the acetic acid pain tests are just a response to toxicants and are not noxious or painful. This means that when you give painkillers, there should be no change in behaviour if it's a toxicant related response. But if it's nociception or pain, there should be painkillers that will then reduce that response. So let's take a look at some, some results on this. In this study, I injected rainbow trout subcutaneously with acetic acid. And when you do this, they perform a rubbing behavior where they rub the, the affected area into the sides of the tanks. And you can see that in the acid injected fish, there is a high amount of rubbing. And the, when, but when you administer morphine, painkiller and analgesic, you get a dramatic reduction in that rubbing behaviour. So this isn't a response to toxicants. And that's also been shown in goldfish by uh, Natalie Newby and colleagues. We can also look at another behaviour, the time to resume feeding. And here we have control sham handled fish. So these were anaesthetised but not injected. Fish which were injected with saline, fish administered with morphine, fish injected with acetic acid and fish injected with acid plus administered with morphine. So you can see that the control groups resume feeding around 80 minutes after the treatment. This is when all the behavioural and physiology responses have gone back to normal, whereas the acid groups suspend normal feeding behaviour for around 180 minutes, three hours after the treatment. So again, uh, morphine is acting as an analgesic here, and this is not a response to a toxicant. This is therefore a response to nociception or pain. My labs test a range of analgesics. These are results from rainbow trout. What you can see here is fish injected with saline, fish injected with acid, and then fish injected with 0.1 buprenorphine, that's 0.1 milligrams per kilogram, and also injected with acid. These are fish with buprenorphine but saline controls. Then we have five milligrams per kilogram of carprofen, the carprofen control, one milligram of lidocaine, and the lidocaine control. This line here represents the impact of the saline injection and anesthesia and handling at 30 minutes after the treatment. And this line here represents the impact of acid as you can see, there is a decrease in activity. And you, when you look along the acid line, you can see that buprenorphine has no effect at 30 minutes after the treatment, whereas lidocaine is almost similar to the saline treatment. So it's very effective in reducing this impact on activity. One of the classic responses of trout is to have an enhanced percolate beat rate, an enhanced gill beat rate. So what you can see here is uh, the impact of saline on saline injection on the trout opercular beat rate at 30 minutes after the treatment and subsequently, and then the impact of acid. So you can see there's a greatly enhanced opercular beat rate. This is much higher than a stress response. So again, if we look at this, when we test this range of analgesics, we can see quite clearly that this is the impact of acid. Again, buprenorphine has very little effect in reducing this. And this is the effect of saline handling, anesthesia, etc. And it would seem that lidocaine is the most effective again. So 
So again, painkillers reduce these behavioral and physiological changes. And so this is not a response to toxicants. And indeed, I have never seen these sorts of behaviors recorded in toxicity tests. And they're not shown by control or sham treated animals. The final argument that I'd like to address is that fish lack the same proportion of sea fibres and A-delta fibres that mammals have. Just to show you that fish do indeed have A-delta and sea fibres, this is the trigeminal nerve of the rainbow trout and you can see the uh, small myelinated A-delta fibres and tiny unmyelinated sea fibres. I was the first to identify nociceptors in fish in 2002. And more recent work by Jonathan Roquez out of Gert Flick's lab in the Netherlands shows that the tail fin also has nociceptors, these A-delta and C fibres, and that has implications for tail fin clipping. So what is the issue here? Well, I'm sure you know that in mammals, A-delta are believed to uh, convey first pain. So when you touch something hot, you, it instantly feels painful and you withdraw your hand. Whereas C fibres are involved in that later pain when there's a lag period and then the burn starts throbbing, starts really hurting. It's C fibre mediated. In birds and amphibians and mammals, C fibres comprise 50% of total fibre type. And reptiles and fish, only 45% are actually C fibres, so much less in proportion. So critics of fish pain suggest that they can't possibly feel that later pain because they have less C fibres. However, our electrophysiological studies have shown that C fibres act like mammalian, sorry, that A delta fibres act like mammalian C fibres. They have the same function. And again, thinking about the evolution of animals, there are going to be differences between humans and animals. So let me just show you some of that data very quickly. This is the location of slowly adapting polymodal nociceptors. These would normally be innervated by C fibres. All but one of these is an A-del, or A-delta fibres. So only one is a C fibre in this image. And this is the position on the fish's face. Slowly adapting means slow uh, mechanical, so a slow firing rate for the duration of any mechanical stimulation and polymodal just means response to more than two types of stimuli. And what we can see here is a trout A delta nociceptor responding to noxious heat. If we damage that area of skin, you can see there's evidence of hyperalgesia. We get a more vigorous response. Here is a A delta polymodal nociceptor showing a prolonged, slowly adapting response to mechanical stimulation. And so basically the A-delta fibres in fish are acting like C fibres. And the electrophysiological properties are strikingly similar to those found in mammals. Some more recent work in my lab has looked at chemically responsive nociceptors. So obviously fish are in an aqueous world, they're exposed to any chemicals that come in. And what we've shown is that these A-delta Polymodal nociceptors respond to acetic acid, carbon dioxide infused water, and also any low pH acids or buffers. So anything with a low pH will excite nociceptors in fish. So I think we've addressed all of the criticisms against fish perceiving pain. And what I'd like to do now is consider whether the being in pain or experiencing pain or nociception, is that actually important to the fish? Because I can show you that the fish have the mechanics, the, the nociceptors, that these, are, that these are similar to mammals, that they process in the right areas of the brain, that they show adverse changes in behaviour and physiology, that this is reduced by the use of a painkiller. But is it, this an important state to be in for the fish? So, what I'd like to do now is show you a video. And in this video, you'll see a rainbow trout feeding on a smooth species of gamaris. And then the two videos after that, the trout are feeding on a spiny gamaris. 
and I'd like you to notice the responses of the fish. Uh, please play the Gamrus video. So you saw that the fish had no trouble eating the smooth species. In the second video, it had a lot of trouble eating the spine species. And in the third video, the trout never attempted to eat that gamrus again. So is this important to the fish? So one of the ways that I've tried to do this is to look at selective attention strategies. There is a theory of attention, just one of the theories, that we have a, a pool or limited capacity to our attention and we can only divert so much attention to competing tasks. Pain is a very attention dominating state to be in in humans. So if we can divert attention away from the pain, it's not very important. In humans, we're, we're, we perform other tasks very poorly. So for example, we're very slow to recall words in a memory test. So I thought I'd use that idea. If pain's not important, I'd be able to distract the fish from it. And I used two paradigms. The first um, was a fear test, um, the novel object test, which is a standard fear paradigm. And the second uh, was based upon the idea that animals tend to avoid being eaten. And so I used a predator cue as very strong competing stimuli. And the novel object test, there were three groups. There was a group which had the novel object, a group which had a familiar object, so we take the fear out of the experiment. A group which had novel object plus morphine, the morphine reduces the pain, so we take pain out of the experiment. I assessed behaviour before and after the injections, and the fish were injected with saline as a control or acetic acid. And what did we find? Well, the object was placed 10 centimetres from the fish's head, so this is the amount of time spent moving towards the object within five centimetres. What you can see here are the results for the novel object, the familiar object, the novel object plus morphine for the saline injected controls and the acid injected fish. For the uh, saline injected controls, they show a classic neophobia, spending very little time in close proximity to the object, whereas the acid injected fish spend around a third of their time in very close proximity and do not show an appropriate fear response. I'd suggest here that pain takes priority over showing fear responses. And indeed, the fish are behaving as if this object was a familiar object. When you administer morphine, you can see that the fish show a neophobic response. We take the pain away and they show an appropriate fear response. In the next experiment, I used a predator cue. Now, one of the things we noticed was that there is high behavioral variation, and this is linked to the bull shy behavioral phenotype. We get fish which are incredibly bold, very active, risk-taking fish and we also get fish which are very shy, timid, sit in a corner and don't do very much. So we decided to assess that first. Then we again scored behaviour, the fish were injected with saline or acid and then water or alarm substance was added to the tank. Now alarm substance is made from damaged fish skin and it alerts conspecifics to the presence of a predator and elicits innate anti-predator behaviours. So it's a really reproducible predator cue. What did we find? Well, <clears throat> here we see the change in activity for the bold saline injected fish and the shy fish. These are the fish injected with acid. So you can see that bold 
controls and shy controls increase activity and are trying to escape. We don't see an increase in activity in the shy fish and this change is not significant. So the fish aren't showing appropriate anti-predator behaviour. That's also reflected in the use of cover. Fish often seek refuge when they believe a predator is in the area. And you can see the controls show an increase in cover use. Whereas the bold fish actually show a decrease and the shy fish no, show no significant change. This would be detrimental in the natural environment, obviously. So again, in this particular context, I would suggest that pain dominates and the fish do not show appropriate anti-predator behaviour. Now, uh, fish have now become the second most popular experimental model. And as such, we have not only an ethical and a moral responsibility to minimise pain, but also a legal responsibility in, in, in many countries. Here you can see fin clipping and zebrafish. This is a routine uh, procedure for genome screening, uh, screening. And this is normally done under anaesthetic, but with no pain relief provided. Fish are subject to invasive procedures. Um, I'd just like to quickly poll and see how many of you actually work on zebrafish. as they become a, a very popular model. So if we could just ask how many of you work on fish actually use zebrafish as a model. So we're looking at about half and half. So you can see that around 42% of users are using zebrafish, um, which is very interesting. So we obviously need a reliable means of assessing pain in fish. And what I'd like you to do is actually um, do this yourself by watching some videos. Um, the first video you're going to see is a normal zebrafish freely swimming. Uh, please play video A. So what you can see there was a freely swimming, calm zebrafish, normal, no interference self for many days. What I'd like you to do now is look at another video, uh, video F, um, and assess whether this is a normal zebrafish or not. Please play, uh, sorry, video D. Please play video D.
So what you could see there was a zebrafish which had a tail fin clip. Um, characteristically, they perform tail wafting where they move the tail very rapidly but don't actually move anywhere. And we also see these erratic bursts of activity followed by periods of sitting on the bottom. So we'll have the next video, video F, please. So in this case, the fish had been uh, given a pit tag and an abdominal pit tag where incision is made. Again, you can see that the fish is spending most of the time in the bottom part of the tank, and this is often seen in tests of anxiety. So if we could have the next video, which is video G, please. So in this case, um, the fish had had an acetic acid test, again, spending a lot of time on the bottom, uh, doing qu performing quite a lot of turns and actually touching the side of the tank with its uh, face. If we could have the next video, please, video H. So in this case, it was an acetic acid injection in, into the muscle. And you can see there's a lot of erratic swimming, followed by a period of uh, actually sitting on the bottom of the tank. So with each type of noxious or painful stimulation, the fish actually do behave quite differently. Um, and this can make pain assessment rather problematic. Um, certainly in zebra, zebra fish, as with the trout, we see an increase in 
uh, a per kilobit rate, which you can see here in red compared to the saline group. We see a reduction in the, um, the duration of swimming, which you can see again here compared to the saline group. But the interesting uh, thing is that there is species specific differences. So really each type of pain and each species are going to have to be assessed to really develop robust indicators. What you can see in this table is, for example, the effects on swimming. The arrow down here uh, means a reduction. This arrow means there's no change. So common carp show no decrease in swimming behaviour, whereas zebrafish do. Conversely, now tilapia and piasu increase swimming activity. We can look at the beat rate, that's a very valid, robust measure in rainbow trout and zebrafish. You can see it goes up in these two groups, but common carp not affected, and it was not measured in now tilapia or piasu. Of course, if we accept that there is some form of pain perception, we have to do something about it to alleviate it. Again, we have the situation where not many analgesics have actually been tested and they the ones that have are only in a few species. So here we have the analgesics, the dose, the species tested, and if there's any side effects and also the efficacy. If you wanted me to recommend analgesics, and I've tested uh, quite a few of these in my lab, I would recommend uh, lidocaine, which should be injected at the site of any uh, tissue damaging uh, stimulus, uh, or morphine, which we usually inject intramuscularly. In fact, all of these analgesics have been tested by injection. We are now developing the idea of using immersion analgesia and obviously in the chamber experiment we actually use lidocaine. We make up a 230 uh, mg per litre solution, then we use 8 ml of that solution for every litre of tank water and that is quite effective because obviously it's not practical to actually inject very small species. So I'd like to um, finish by doing a couple of things. One of those is to poll you again and find out if you've actually changed your opinion of fish pain. So I'm just gonna launch another poll. So do, do fish perceive sensory pain? Please answer yes, maybe or no. So I'm very pleased to report that I've managed to convince you that there is some likelihood for pain perception of fish and that this is important and we do need to be aware of how to assess and minimize that. Um, I'll just write these down. And finally, thank my uh, funding bodies. We're in the, the midst of developing an intelligent monitoring software system that can accurately detect whether fish are experiencing stress or pain. And I'd like to thank my postdocs who, um, who produced the videos and pictures, John Buckley and Kieran Pounder. And uh, I'd also like to thank you. If you'd like any further information um, on our lab, please go and have a look at our website, which I've just opened for you now. And uh, just say thank you very much for your attention and I'll leave you with the zebrafish face. So now I will uh, look at the questions that have been posed. So the first question comes from George Sanders at the University of Washington. Hi, George. He asked, have you evaluated the analgesic properties of MS-222 as it relates to pain response in fish? Uh, 
I have used MS-222 for anaesthesia during uh, many procedures. We used benzocaine, which is pharmacologically very similar for some of the electrophysiology work. Um, so we, although we washed the face so there was no benzocaine on the face, uh, we still got nociceptors responding. There is a recent paper in COI, which has looked at the effects of MS-222 um, in surgery and has shown that 150 mg per litre is the minimum dose required to block nociceptive reflexes. So I hope that answers your question. I think we're probably using too low concentrations, but then we have to trade it off against actually making sure that the fish comes round from anaesthesia. So George has another question, were the tail fin clip procedures conducted for these videos done under anaesthesia if so was buffered MS-222 used? Um, we actually use benzocaine, um, so we get, we get away with not buffering, but when I have used MS-222, I obviously would use buffer because it's very acidic. Um, and yes, these procedures are always conducted an, under anaesthesia. I, I just think that that is vital. So Anna Valentin from IBMC has asked, in the video of the tail fin clip, how long was the procedure and under which analgesia anesthesia? Um, essentially, uh, the procedure probably took about 30 seconds, the actual tail fin clipping. The anesthesia um, takes um, a few minutes to make sure the fish has gone into deep clean anesthesia. We never do any of these interventions unless the fish is at least at deep plane and, and sometimes in surgical plane. Um, the question is, there was no analgesia provided, absolutely no analgesia. Um, we have done sham controls and shown that the anesthetic has no effect on behavior. So no, this is not due to the anesthetic. Um, George Sanders again asks if the acetic acid injection procedures are um, done without anaesthesia and I guess I've answered that no we don't do any of our procedures without anaesthetic. George Sanders asks when you use lidocaine dissolved into the water how do you dispose of that solution after use in fish? for that length of time and then we just naturally flush out the lidocaine again we have to assess that you know there are no adverse effects of that so our, our experiments are quite short term they don't last any longer than six hours um, but you know basically we flush it out um, after six hours is up I have a, a question from Paul Gibbs at Glaxo Smith Klein. Have studies compared native rainbow trout as opposed to genetically modified or farm raised trout? Well, uh, rainbow trout aren't native to the UK. Um, and the ones that I've used have come from a fish farm. Um, so the results that are presented today are all from fish farm fish. Um, I've never used gen genetically modified. I don't know of any studies using wild rainbow trout or genetically modified. Alejandro Escobar from the University of Chile asks, do you have a good guide for assessing pain in fish? Yes, please do look at some of the references on my slides. Thanks very much for your attention. My broadcast is now over. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.